what I'd like to talk to you about today is how to take care of yourself and how to make sure that you're dealing with any mental health issues early on before they get too bad, okay? <clears throat> so this is me shamelessly pandering to our culture of making fun <laughs> of our culture. Next up, let's talk about comorbidity. Comorbidity is a term that refers to the overlap of two or more things, like those circles overlapping. Uh, there is a very high percentage of comorbidity between autism and other mental health disorders. And, uh, and so the most common ones that are experienced are, are uh, stress, which isn't actually a diagnosis, but stress is a frequent problem that accompanies uh, autism. And then uh, more specifically, anxiety, depression, ADHD, and uh, other related disorders. So what is anxiety? Well, anxiety is when your sympathetic nervous system gets triggered. And your, your brain thinks that there is a danger when it's not actually physically dangerous. And so your sympathetic nervous system gets triggered and it sends out chemical and electrical messages to all throughout your body. Yes? Uh, why don't you go to, like, as an example, like, I have anxiety a lot during meetings. Yes. So, like, uh, when it reaches, like, sort of, like, really, really anxious, like, I've seen in some people where it's like, so I don't want to it, so. The climax? Yeah. Yeah, good. Uh, yeah, and then, Along with that, something that makes me, that makes me, well, the number one thing that makes me really anxious, anxious is just going to, um, going to sports games like basketball or football. Mm, games. Like, mm -hmm. It's like I'm so anxious about, them, about my team, about my team winning. Yes, that, know, that, that, that's your trigger for your yeah. sympathetic nervous yeah, system. In general, I just want feelings whenever, I just in general thinking about things that, that to come. Right. And so I tend to prefer to stay Yes, yeah, so oftentimes, oftentimes we can get anxious about things in the future, right? Uh, because they might seem dangerous to us in some way. Um, let me give you an example. I like what you said about movies. This is an example. When I was a child, this is going to reveal my age, but I went to see Star Trek II Wrath of Khan in the theater, the original time, yes. And I was, a, I was, I, I can't remember exactly when it came out, so I was probably eight. It was 82? Yeah. Great. So 82 means I was six years old. And I, I don't know what my parents were thinking letting me go to see Wrath of Khan <laughs> in the theater at six years old, but they did. And I was so freaked out by it, you know, when like the Khan was putting the things in their ears, right? Yeah, the the, yeah whatever. I can't remember what they called them, but. That freaked me out so much that my sympathetic nervous system got triggered and I had to get out of there, right? I had the fight or flight urge. And that's what happens when your sympathetic nervous system gets triggered. You have the fight or flight urge. And I told my friend Rulin, who was sitting right by me, I got to get a breath of fresh air. <laughs> I didn't want to admit that I was scared, right? But I had to get a breath of fresh air because the air was stale in there. So that's. That reminded me of that. When, you're, when your brain thinks something's dangerous, it triggers that sympathetic nervous system. And the sympathetic nervous system tells your body to get ready to deal with the danger. And the, dan the way that your body does that is by shutting down systems that are necessary for, for long-term survival and ramping up systems necessary for short-term survival. And so things like your digestion and your bowel and bladder control and um, immune response, and higher logic, and memory, and word finding, and reasoning, all of those things get shut down when your uh, sympathetic nervous system gets triggered. And that's why it's so hard to think when you're anxious. Your brain goes into kind of primitive caveman mode, and it just locks onto that danger and spins on it, and focuses on it, and we get, we get kind of tunnel vision, and it's really hard to think of anything else. And we want to deal with that danger. And the way that our brain wants to deal with that danger is by 
fighting it or fleeing it. And so a lot of what we do when we're anxious is either uh, getting mad. Or getting jitters. Right, getting jitters. Now jitters are a symptom of anxiety because your muscles have a lot of energy and adrenaline because they're ready to fight this physical danger. But unfortunately, most of the things that we get anxious about these days, they're not physically dangerous, right? They're psychologically dangerous, but not physically dangerous. And so we end up having all this energy in our muscles that are going nowhere. And instead, we can't think straight. Our brain is, is shut down. Okay? So <clears throat> that's the physiology. Yes? I'm sorry, just in relation to the movie thing. Mm -hmm. going to see but there was a preview and it showed a movie theater like as if the screen had a camera uh -huh. and it said smile you're on camera oh no like, yeah. smile for the camera and then this and so like it goes on as normal and of course me having autism checked to see if there actually was, was a, camera. a camera right and so I calm myself down you know there's no camera. Nobody's actually watching us. Yeah, so that was a then, trigger for you. Then this girl just appears in one of the empty seats next to a guy, and the camera does this really giant zoom in on it. Oh, no. And she screams, and, like, her face is like the grudge. Oh, shoot. And so I was literally on edge for the entire time and yeah the movie itself that I was there to see wasn't even that scary but that ad had triggered such a such a physical fight, reaction a fight response in yeah. me that I I could not relax yeah and when when your physiology gets triggered for anxiety that fight that uh, sympathetic nervous system it actually takes about 90 minutes for your body to calm back down to baseline. It takes a long time. And so uh, you have to be willing and able to deal with the symptoms that you're experiencing uh, during that time that your body's calming down. So for most of the movie, Mary was anxious, right? Mm -hmm. Because she had had that, that trigger that happened, okay? And the symptoms that we experience when we're anxious are things like the nervousness and jitteriness that you mentioned. Right? And then uh, decreased memory and word finding and reasoning. Uh, our heart rate can increase. Our breathing can change. Sometimes some people will breathe faster. Some people breathe uh, more shallow. It just depends. Uh, we can have tightness in our muscles or uh, pain or uh, like a pit in our stomach. Um, some people have to feel like they have to use the, the restroom uh, and other things like that. And all of those things are just physiological changes for your body to try and deal with the danger that it thinks is there, okay? What about depression? Depression isn't quite as directly physiological as anxiety. And depression is uh, more, that, I mean, there is a, phys a physiological uh, component to depression, but there's more to depression than just the physiological component. Uh, and that is your thought processes and how you explain events in your life. And uh, what they've found is that people who tend to experience depression and anxiety tend to explain things using personal, permanent, and pervasive explanations. So if you think about, let's say that you took a, a test, you were, you were taking a class in college or something like that, and you, you took a test, and you came out of the test and you saw that you got like a 30% on it. And you're like, oh, shoot, I'm so stupid, right? Intelligence is permanent. It affects many areas of your life and it's personal to you. Now, what if your evil twin brother came and took the same test and got a 30 and he came out with you, you both got a 30, and you said, oh, I'm so stupid, and your evil twin brother said, wow, that was a really hard test. I think the teacher wrote some tricky questions. 
I should have studied more. Who's going to feel better? Your evil twin brother is going to feel better, right? Because he's explaining that event in less personal, changeable, and situational uh, types of explanations. Okay? So the symptoms of... Yes, Mary? Sorry, just... I Nothing to be sorry about. If that were the case, like if I was in that situation, I would feel worse about myself because he's saying I just didn't... I should have studied more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and everyone's different. Yeah, and so you need to know yourself... Um, this is, no, it's okay. This is just kind of a general example. Yeah. I'm just comparing Iron Man's guilt over not being able to save people that died during the Sokovia incident uh -huh. in Age of Ultron. Right. So Cap says, save, I save, but I can't. Yeah. Hey, that's a wonderful example, right? Captain America is showing the uh, optimistic viewpoint. And, uh, Iron Man is showing the pessimistic viewpoint. Because he, uh, because oh, you're fine. Right. Yeah, great example. So, the symptoms of depression. Symptoms of depression include things like feeling sad or down, but it doesn't always include feeling sad or down. Sometimes it can just be irritable. You can be kind of tense and irritable and angry rather than sad or down. Uh, it includes difficulties with sleep. It includes difficulties with your appetite, either increased appetite or decreased appetite. Uh, it can include um, lack of motivation, lower energy, feeling tired all the time, feeling listless. Uh, one, the, the technical term for one of the symptoms is called anhedonia, and anhedonia refers to not finding interest or pleasure in things that used to interest you, that you used to like to do. Uh, and then sometimes even like thoughts about death or suicide. Those are all symptoms of depression that uh, can show up when you are, uh, when you're feeling down, when you're feeling depressed, okay? Uh, the physiology with depression is not well understood, but uh, it clearly has something to do with neurotransmitters in the brain, the chemicals that, uh, that um, are sent between the neurons. And uh, there's a number of different neurotransmitters that are implicated, but uh, all of our work with, um, with medications and depression and uh, the neurotransmitters, it's all kind of guesswork. So trial and error. Yeah, did you have something? Like, uh, well, the brain, like, it's like the most complex one, organic to the computer that, like, mm -hmm. absolutely. So many yeah. That is so much like they're nearing that complexity, complexity with uh, computers and all that. But yeah, we got a ways to go still. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, the brain is a very complex thing, and uh, so it's really, we, we don't understand a whole lot about it. Uh, I just wanted to share another experience. Now, anxiety is one form of stress, and stress is the larger uh, descriptor the descriptive term that we use to refer to those times when our brain is faced with a danger or some sort of challenge. And so it triggers changes to try and deal with that challenge. And I just wanted to uh, give you an example that really shows how it can affect how you think and even how you perceive things. Yeah. Uh, like, uh, when I, like I play Zelda a lot. Uh -huh. so like when on my first, when I first started Breath of the Wild, I like, so I can, like, I was walking around trying to find the first four shrines. And then right. I come up to, like, this boulder. And then the ghost demon will say, oh, overworld bus, run! <laughs> yes. Get out of there. That's a good example, the fight or flight response. But it was like, oh, yeah, yeah. 
terms of I've heard of get me down there or else you'll die. Get right. Me down there. Get me down there. Uh huh. Yeah, good example. That's what your brain's doing. Your brain is telling you, get out of here or you'll die, basically. Okay? So here's an example. Um, uh, almost 20 years ago, when I was uh, a young adult, mid 20s, I. Um, I was uh, interested in romantically dating a certain young woman, and uh, she lived up in Salt Lake City. I lived down here in Utah County, and so one time I went up to visit her, but I, I was kind of an anxious young man, and so I drove up there to Salt Lake City to see her, but before I saw her, I, uh, I went to the gas station to fill up the car. And I pulled up and, you know, I opened the gas can and I pulled out my credit card and I stuck it in the credit card reader and no, it didn't work. I was like, what's going on? I tried it again. What's going on? Then I started getting angry. What? This is it's not working. This is, It's broken, right? And I got really, really angry and, uh, and just like I was, I, I uh, couldn't figure out what was going on. I, yeah, I did. That's kind of... Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That happens a lot at my work when, mm -hmm. I, like, I work at Megaplex, so uh -huh. sometimes, like, the rewards cards go right. demagnetized so they can't scan. And, like, when there's a rush, I have to quickly type in the number manually. Yes. Sometimes the, the touch screen won't register the input I put. Right. And the, Yes, you guys are you guys are describing great examples of stress, right? And I was experiencing stress and anxiety, and I, finally I was just so upset. I just like got back in the car and was like, I'll, I'll deal with this later, right? And I drove off, not getting the gas that I kind of needed. Uh, it wasn't until I calmed down about 90 minutes later that I realized that I was probably putting my card in backwards. <laughs> it was not working because I couldn't figure out. I was so stressed that I couldn't, I was, I, I couldn't quite see clearly and think clearly enough to problem solve through that difficulty and turn my card around and put it in the right way. That's like, that's like one of the things about, like, like, like the, more, the more stressed you feel, That's like, exactly right. And then, like, and then, like, later on, you, later on, you, like, like, realize, you, like, realize, um, there's, 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 there's like, ways you're wrong. You're like, oh, that's like an idiot. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So you're absolutely right. That's the point I'm trying to make. Stress is pretty pervasive. We have lots of stress in our lives in lots of areas, and when we experience stress, the higher the stress, the less clearly we can think. And it makes it hard to problem solve through and deal with difficulties. And so this is where we're leading. We're leading to self-care, right? But before we talk about self-care, let's talk about how your symptoms of autism can complicate symptoms of anxiety, depression, and other mental health disorders. Yes? What about things like addictions, like um, alcohol, drugs, mm -hmm. uh, video games, or pornography? Yeah, those are all uh, mental health disorders as well, and they can be comorbid with autism, and uh, your autism symptoms can, uh, can complicate those as well. They are less frequent than anxiety and depression, and so I'm, I'm focusing today on anxiety and depression, but some of the skills we'll talk about can also be applied to those. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up. Okay, so here are some of the symptoms of, a, of autism that can complicate anxiety and depression. Um, first of all, there's cognitive rigidity. Have you heard of that term before? Cognitive rigidity refers to the, the tendency for your brain to lock onto something and have a hard time kind of uh, uh, being flexible and thinking about other things. And so uh, research says that individuals with autism 
not always, but sometimes have more cognitive rigidity than neurotypical individuals. And, uh, and so it, it can be hard when you're really focused on something to shift your attention and think about other things. Yes? Like, uh, like, like, first of all, the example, like, I like, like, when I'm in the certain trying, I, I just couldn't figure the puzzle out. Uh-huh. So I just, like. And you couldn't let go of it, I'm guessing? Yeah. Yeah, you, you were like, I got to figure this out, but you couldn't figure it out. I eventually, like, just said, hey, look up on the internet. Ah, good. Now, that's a wonderful example, OK? You were eventually able to get out of that cognitive rigidity and problem solve through that problem. That's what we're going for. Yeah. Also, like, one, like one, of, the, one of the the hard things I know that's like, especially, especially for me, like, like a lot of times we, we have autism, like, um, like, 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 so a lot of people with autism tend to be so, like, so eager to get things done, like, right, like, right away, like, right mm -hmm. now. Yeah. Like, they, don't, they don't have a lot of, like, like patience. Like, patience is, like, like probably one of, the, one of the hard things. Like, yes. With autism, like, um, like, like, if I'm, if I'm trying to build something out of Legos or make something, and it's, like, I have to, like, like, like I get so eager, and, like, I want, I want to get something done now. I want it to be done now. Yes. And so, yeah, patience. Patience. But I don't have a lot of patience. So, so, so it turns out kind of, kind of bad at the end, but... That's absolutely right. Yeah. So patience can be uh, can be related to cognitive rigidity because you have this goal in mind and you want to move singularly towards that goal. You don't want anything to get in the way of yeah. that goal, right? Yeah. Now, cognitive rigidity can uh, can really influence and complicate anxiety and depression. Uh, let me give you some kind of theoretical or hypothetical examples, okay? Let's say that you're anxious about a certain thing that, that might happen in the future. Well, you might want to come up with a plan of how to deal with that. But cognitive rigidity gets in the way of you being able to think through possible alternatives and come up with some creative, viable alternatives to deal with that. And so oftentimes you can kind of get stuck on believing there's one right way of doing things, of going about solving that problem. And, and that can, that can uh, get in the way of dealing effectively with that thing. Yes? Like, for an example, like, like for, like, in, like, I don't know, like, when I play video games like like Zelda or like Skyrim, mm -hmm. I like strategize the path of defeating the enemy like, right. mm -hmm. way through. And like I like I study the opponent. Mm -hmm. Like Breath of Wild is the most complex opponent AI. Mm -hmm. So Yeah. So, or the enemy learns and like. Right. Good. Like yeah. You like, just keep on throwing the bombs. They like. Yeah. Bombs so, so you have. So that's a situation where you would have to uh, have flexibility in your thinking to come up with new strategies and plans rather than doing the same thing over and over again. Yeah. Great. And like, uh, like, I eventually became strong enough that I just. Uh -huh. came up to before yeah. and just came up with a map of sorts and started hacking and hacking and hacking at it. Yeah, so uh, eventually, sometimes, like in that example, you might uh, have enough skills eventually to just go forward with your one way of doing things. But before then, you've got to develop some cognitive flexibility yeah. to deal with things differently. Yeah. Okay. Now, with uh, depression, Cognitive rigidity can influence depression as well because a lot of times people who are depressed experience uh, what's called learned helplessness, meaning they, uh, they feel like there's no way to deal with a problem. When in actuality, there are some different ways of dealing with things, but they're so stuck 
in their thinking, their learned helplessness, that they can't think out of that. And so, so uh, having more cognitive rigidity is going to make that worse. Yeah. yeah I was just going to say, and then add autism to that. Exactly. Especially for me personally, one of the biggest things that always throws me off is catastrophic in my thinking. Mm-hmm. Yeah, catastrophic thinking yeah, can be a really diff difficult thing. Always throws me off. So catastrophic thinking uh, is related to anxiety. Oftentimes when we're anxious, we can assume the worst is going to happen. And, and if, we're, if we struggle with cognitive flexibility, then it makes it hard to see other possible outcomes that could happen. Yeah, it makes it hard to see the Occam's razor, if you will. Right, the simplest explanation. Yes? Also, also one thing that, I, that, that, that they sometimes will struggle with is just, um, especially with the kind of office of autism, is just um, when I, whenever I try trying to get, 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 get something done, I, I'm, all, I'm always like, so focused on like, like that one thing, like I'm trying to get that stuff straight, I want to be focused on, focused on one thing, like, like someone just telling me, Right. Yeah. So that's a great example of cognitive rigidity, focusing on one thing. Right. Okay. So another symptom of autism that can often complicate things is difficulties with social interactions. Right. Being able to understand social interactions and communicate effectively with other people. And uh, I, I hope it's fairly clear how that can complicate anxiety, right? If you're anxious about something happening, but you struggle to talk with other people about that, then that's going to get in the way of you coping effectively with the anxiety. Same thing with depression. If you are feeling bad about something, if you're depressed, if you're struggling and you are having a hard time understanding other people, it's hard for you to get the support and the help that you need. And that can complicate your depression. Yeah? A good example is of the uh, not being able to relate to people is like uh, the flash from the movie Jungle Cruise. Oh, I haven't seen that one. Yep. Like, that version of the flash has autism. Really? Yeah. OK. I'll have to He's watch like, it. People are slow. Like, <laughs> there you go. His brain has to run at faster than the speed of light. Gotcha. Oh, yeah. yeah. OK, great example. Thank you. Um, let's see. Some other, um, some other uh, complications that I was going to talk about. Um, executive functioning. So uh, <laughs> autism. Yes. Well, so acting like a control freak is actually more related to cognitive rigidity because uh, anxiety and cognitive rigidity makes you think that, that you have to control everything in order to not be anxious about it. Like, and so, <laughs> okay, I haven't actually seen it yet, but I'm guessing that that's the case. Uh, executive functioning can also get in the way of you accomplishing things that you want to do. Time management, planning, uh, um, organization, and following through on commitments all are more difficult when you have executive functioning difficulties. And when those things happen in your life, it's going to make life more difficult. So you're probably going to feel more anxious and more depressed, and or more depressed. Um, and then uh, the last one I wanted to talk about is not a diagnostic symptom of anxiety, but it or sorry, of autism, but it often comes along with it. It's something called alexithymia. Alexithymia is difficulty with uh, knowing or noticing and being able to describe your emotional internal experience. And, uh, and so struggling with uh, dealing with emotions and noticing your emotions. Hopefully this one's pretty clear, right? If you have a hard time noticing what's going on with you, then it's going to be hard to deal with the anxiety and depression that you're experiencing. Yes? When I was a little kid, like, my family, like, kept on watching these shows like uh, Monk and uh, oh, yeah. Big Bang Theory. Uh -huh. So whenever I went into my, like, uh, phrases of, like, obsessiveness and stuff like that, mm -hmm. uh, my mom said, Sheldon, Sheldon, go away, Sheldon. Mm.
Okay, so uh, I'm hearing you say that that was maybe helpful for you for your mom to do that. Yeah. Okay, good. Now, you're, what you're illustrating is um, some of the self-care stuff that I want you to, to try and work on. And that is, uh, even if you have alexithymia, that doesn't mean that you can't learn to identify what's going on with you. What it means is that you have more difficulty identifying what's going on with you. But you can still learn it. It's just going to take more conscious effort. And so one of the things that's going to be helpful for you, uh, whether or not you have alexithymia, is spending some time and effort to get to know your internal emotional experience better so that you can identify when you're struggling, when your emotions are heightened when you're uh, experiencing difficulties versus the times when you're feeling a little better and your emotions are positive. Because if you uh, work on that and, and develop the ability to identify that, that frees you up to then do something about it, to seek help, to get support, to do different coping skills, and find ways to deal effectively with your emotions. But first, you have to know that you have those emotions to deal with them, right? And so it's really important. I'm sorry, what's your name? Brandon. Brandon. Like Brandon brought up, it's really important to start learning ways to identify when those times are happening. Okay? All right. Here are some other self-care things. Now, hopefully this isn't too odious for you because a lot this self-care is not rocket science. I wish that it was like amazing and mind-blowing, but unfortunately it's not. Self-care are most of the things that your mom would tell you to do, right? Proper nutrition, good sleep, exercise, hygiene, uh, meeting all of, your, all of, all of the uh, commitments that you make, whether you're going to work or going to school or, or doing your chores or whatever it is. Uh, Self-care involves uh, making sure that you're not doing things that complicate your life too much, that m cause more problems for you. Yes? Also, um, something that can, that can be kind of hard for, that can, that, that can, that can be kind of hard for annoying for people is that um, um, most people, people that have autism tend to need, tend to, tend to need to, um, tend to need to have uh, more, sleep, more sleep than um, for, 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 for the most people. They tend, they tend to get, to get sleepier than they, because they, because they, yeah, they, they need more sleep hmm. I, I wasn't aware of the research on that, but I... Uh, and everyone's different. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. And then for me, um, I, have, I have a job that throws my sleep schedule off. That's rough. Like from 10 p.m. to 7 a.m. the next morning. Oh, no. Unfortunately, it's only one day a week. Okay. And on top of that, even before then, I have the tendency to stay up super late, like... Mm -hmm. like past like 4 a.m. or something. Right. It's extremely tempting to do that because um, because it's it's a lot quieter at that time. The light, the mm -hmm. light levels are subdued, so it's easier on your eyes. Yes. And you can you can either get you can either get a lot of things done, mm -hmm. or you can waste a lot of time playing video games or looking at pornography. Right. That's right. Yeah. So. Um, Sleep is really important. Like, I could go into all of those self-care stuff more, more in more detail, the reasons for it, but, but specifically see, sleep. What they found is that sleep problems at, and, and uh, sleep deprivation, they cause the same symptoms as depression. And so if you're not getting good sleep, you're probably going to feel depressed. And so it's really important to work on your sleep habits and, and make sure that you're taking care of yourself in that way. Um, let's see. So nutrition, make sure that you're eating healthy. Uh, your brain functions on blood glucose. And willpower functions on blood glucose. Being able to get yourself to do the things that you need to do to have a healthy life uh, requires willpower and brain functioning. Well, sugar gives you a quick burst, but if you eat healthy nutrition, three meals a day, 
with you know, following good nutritional guidelines, that's going to provide a long, drawn-out level of, of blood sugars throughout the day. And that's going to be much more healthy for you than eating sugar. Now, sugar's not bad. Uh, you can eat a moderate amount of sugar, and it can be helpful for you. And if you need a short burst of energy, yeah, go for some sugar. That's totally cool, right? Well, that's up to you. I'm not a doctor, so I'm not going to make like uh, recommendations on that or anything. But the point is, the point is that you got to take care of yourself. The more you take care of yourself, the better you're going to be able to deal with other difficulties like anxiety, depression, other mental health disorders. Okay. Um, let's see. What else? Uh, things like writing in your journal or writing a blog or uh, stream of consciousness writing, um, talking to somebody that, that supports you, that you feel supported by and helped by, uh, so uh, communicating in that way, or, and or doing things that move you towards your long-term goals every day. Those are all things that are self-care tasks that can help you get out some of that emotion some of the stress that you're experiencing so that it doesn't build up over time and cause you difficulties. Okay? Like I said, it's not rocket science, uh, but it's hard to do. Even though it's easy, it's hard to do. Right? Getting good nutrition, that takes effort. It takes time. Writing in a journal, that takes effort. Uh, getting good sleep, it, it's really hard to get yourself to go to bed when it's time to go to bed. It, Yeah, that transition is interesting, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So now let's uh, talk about some more specific details about coping. Hey, you got it. Yes. <laughs> all right. A little, little uh, joke there, right? That's a coping saw for those of you who don't know. <laughs> all right. Wah, wah, wah. That's right. Yeah, Mary. Oh, you're fine. No. Good, good. I like that you're bringing that up. Let's talk about coping and I'll address that, okay? okay thank you. Yeah, for sure. Hold on to your questions for a second. We're running a little low on time. I want to get through this and then I'll answer any uh, questions that you have, okay? No, you're fine. Don't, don't apologize. You're totally cool. All right, so there's three basic types of coping. There is distraction. There is passive coping. And there's active coping, okay? Distraction is exactly what it sounds like. You're, you're removing yourself temporarily from whatever you're trying to cope with. You're, you're distracting yourself with movies or games or me, I like to distract with exercise. Exercise is also a good coping mechanism, but sometimes I use it just as a distraction, right? Everyone's got different ways that they distract themselves. And distraction can be an okay coping mechanism, Good, exactly. Anything taken to excess can cause problems, right? Yeah, right? Water is important for life, but you can die if you drink too much water. Torture weed for weed. <laughs> That's right. Okay, so, so the important thing is to do distraction in moderation. Use it wisely, right? Now, passive coping is when you're coping with the emotions that you're experiencing. And so it's uh, things like, uh, like uh, maybe writing about your emotions or uh, talking to people about your emotions. It's not addressing the actual problem. It's addressing the emotions that you're experiencing from the problem. So it can be, it can, you can do things, I mean, you're doing things. So in a sense, it's active. But I call it passive coping because you're not actually addressing the actual problem. Active coping 
actually focuses on the actual problem and you're, you're doing things to problem solve through it and solve that difficulty. Now some of those difficulties can't be solved and so you have to rely on passive coping. But those are the distinctions that you need to pay attention to. Pass, uh, active coping is the most effective if you have control over that thing. Passive coping can be helpful. It helps you decrease your emotions so that you can deal with, you can do the active coping. And then distraction, distraction is useful at times, but be careful about it. Yeah? Uh, like say, uh, like when, like, act, like, it's really hard to start writing something. Yes. So then I get ideas, like, I usually, like, then in high school, I was saying, like, like, I, like, whenever, like, I wanted to write a paper on some, on some topic for English, mm -hmm. I sort of really wanted to compare it to, compare that, the book I was supposed to write it about, mm -hmm. the topic about, mm -hmm. to a similar situation from, like, Jaws or whatever. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So uh, um, getting started writing an assignment is a way of, um, uh, is a problem that we can often experience. And sometimes we cope with that problem in unhealthy ways, right? And so this is, you got to look at your different ways of coping and identify when they're healthy coping mechanisms and when they're unhealthy coping mechanisms. If they tend to cause more problems in your life by doing them, those are unhealthy coping mechanisms. So distraction can be an unhealthy coping mechanism if it lends to procrastination and uh, gets in the way of doing the things that you're supposed to be doing, right? Uh, and other things uh, also can be unhealthy uh, forms of coping if it gets in the way. All right, so, uh, this is another of my main recommendations for you, is that you pay attention to what type of coping you're using. And as much as possible, try and focus on the active coping, where you're identifying what the real problem is and taking steps to deal with that problem rather than using distraction or passive coping. Now, it's okay, like I said, to use distraction and passive coping at times, but don't neglect the active coping. Because if you neglect the active coping, that problem's not going away. You're gonna be stuck doing the passive coping and the distraction for a long time. So make sure that you're taking steps to address that problem, okay? Could you give an example of active coping? Yes, for sure. So let's say, um, uh, sorry, was it Brandon? So Brandon gave us the example of writing an assignment for a class, right? Uh, distraction would be, I'll deal with that later, I'm going to play some Zelda, right? Yeah. Passive coping would be, that's making me really anxious, I'm going to talk with my friend about how anxious I am, okay? Active coping would be like, wow, I'm really anxious about this assignment, so I'm going to think about how I'm going to do this assignment, I'm going to plan it out, and I'm going to get started and work on it. Break it down, right. That's a skill you can use. Break it down kind of like the, the mathematical concept of factoring, right? You factor a problem to its smallest denominators so that you can actually start on one thing and move forward. Yes? And also, is it, it actually can be helpful, not helpful for me because um, most people with autism, including me, like, tend to get like, distracted very easily, like, mm -hmm. like doing one thing, but like, um, like there, there are things like all around us that can, that, 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 that can easily distract us from what, what we're trying to do. Uh, yep. Yes. Yeah. So uh, that that can be a symptom, uh, one of those complicating symptoms of autism that yeah. that can get in the way of dealing effectively with yeah. stuff. And if that's the case, again, what I'm encouraging you to do is be aware, try and work on your awareness of when that's happening so that you can notice it sooner and sooner when it's happening and take steps to change it. Yes. yes. So say my daughter has a hard time with that with her room. Uh -huh. I'm cleaning the room because there's so many things, it's overwhelming. Right. And overstimulating in so many. So she has helped, like, if she just focuses 
on one corner of the room first. Good. And clean that. And Good. Then you move to a different area. And that's a great way of breaking it down to smaller pieces so that you can tackle a piece that's not so overwhelming. And then you can move on to others. Great example. Thank you. All right. So now, there are times where your own coping may not be enough, and you need to seek help. And this is a part of self-care as well. And one of the difficulties that, uh, that I've seen individuals with autism experience is uh, difficulty with cognitive rigidity not being willing to seek help when they need help. And the second part of that is oftentimes when they're willing to seek help, sometimes they're not open to the suggestions that the people give that they've sought help from. And so those two difficulties are, again, just illustrations of how the, the cognitive rigidity can get in the way of things. So my recommendation is that you become aware of when you're feeling or experiencing that cognitive rigidity and work on checking yourself and stepping back and asking how you can be a little more flexible and be open to those, uh, those situations, okay? Now, seeking help. When do you need to seek help? My recommendation is that you seek help when the problem is getting in the way of things or you know, causing a problem in your life and you're feeling like you're not able to fully deal with it, okay? Now that's a, that's a pretty good uh, uh, guideline if you're self-aware. You might need to also pay attention to those who are, love you and support you and are around you and listen to them when they're telling you it's causing you a problem. And again, it might, you might have to kind of check your cognitive rigidity, uh, but you may need to uh, step back and say, okay, I've got people telling me that this is a problem, even though I don't think it's a problem. Maybe I need to listen to them a little bit, okay? Now, there's another time when you can seek help, and this is an easier guideline, and that is when you want help. If you want help with something, you're free to seek help for that thing, and that's totally cool, okay? Um, all right, uh, how do you seek help? Well, seek help by asking for it. Uh, I don't mean this to sound infantile or anything like that, but communication is difficult sometimes. Interacting with people is difficult. And so you, you can make it simple. You can just say help. You can go up to somebody and ask for help with one word. Now, you can be more complicated than that if you want to. Uh, you can do it electronically. You can do it with a note, you can do it in person, you can do it over the phone, whatever makes, whatever is most comfortable for you, but it's important to ask for help. Yes, Mary. Would playing one of the Beatles albums be a good way to ask for it? <laughs> um, oh. If you also communicate that you're, you're, you're being serious about that message. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. but, but having some vehicle to help you uh, communicate that is, is fine. And you can even set up a situation with the people that know you and love you and support you where you have some sort of code word or code signal where you can, you can give that code word or signal to let them know that you need help. Okay? All right. So let's say that you seek help. Uh, well, there are some uh, different resources that you can use to seek help from. Parents, friends, NAMI.org. Crisis text line is a great one for those who don't want to talk on the phone. If you're in crisis, you can go to crisistextline.org and follow their instructions to get hooked up with someone who will text you, and you can text them when you're in crisis. Family members are good. Religious leaders can be helpful. Uh, Scenic View Academy can be helpful. Uh, uni has a crisis line that you can call. And uh, also, especially for stress and anxiety, if you go to caps.byu.edu slash biofeedback, uh, they give a lot of great resources and knowledge and training about stress and how to deal with it. So uh, any questions? It's been a pleasure for me to be here and present to you, and I wish you all the best. Hopefully you enjoy Infinity War tonight if you're going to it. And, uh, that your evening of May the 4th is wonderful. Thanks, everyone.